I suppose that's something that man starts to do every day with some eye glazing muscle, I think so. So, uh, yeah, it's usually how to cook. Sure. Okay, so we have to introduce today the rest of the infrastructure that we will use in your second year to do quantum series. In particular, the second years may have noticed that so far I have introduced function spaces, various differential equations around it, but when you did it with Marina, mysteriously you were given a matrix and told to do something about it, and your wave functions for the various um, conjugated and aromatic systems you considered were also mysterious detectors rather than functions. And so today our mission is to derive the connection between the wave function representation of quantum theory and the matrix representation of it. And we will start with the notion of a linear map and a linear operator. Item one, linear maps. maps and operators. Imagine we have two spaces. A space D populated by something, perhaps functions or vectors, it doesn't really matter. Over some field, um, like the complex numbers. And then another field, W, another space, again populated by some functions um, and perhaps some vectors. And anything else that might satisfy the properties that we have discussed in the previous lecture of a space. Then there will be transformations that take vectors or functions out of here and put them there. For example, the operation that projects three-dimensional vectors onto the xy plane will be taking vectors from a three-dimensional space and placing them in a two-dimensional space. If you take a space functions um, and you, for example, differentiate them, then whatever functions have been living inside V would be transferred inside W by the differentiation operation. A cosine here would map into minus sign there, a unit here would map into zero there. So there are operations that take things there and back. These are called pre-images of the corresponding images in the W. Now, one particular object that makes a lot of appearance in quantum mechanics is something called a linear operator. So an operator A mapping some space V into some space W is called linear. Roughly speaking, it maps linear combinations into the corresponding combinations of images. That is to say, if I take a sum of two functions here, it should be mapped into the sum of the corresponding functions there. That is, acting 1, A acting on F plus G is AF plus FG for any F and G belonging to B. Likewise, we must require for it to be a linear map that if we multiply a function or a vector here by a constant, its image must likewise be multiplied by a constant. So A acting on alpha f should be alpha f for any alpha in our scalar field and for any function in B. Normally, if we are dealing with functions, um, operators have hats on them, like that. And if we are dealing with vectors, they are normally um, indicated with a bold font, because as we shall see in a moment, they are actually matrices. Examples of linear operators are plentiful. So any matrix multiplication, if we have a multiplication of a vector by a matrix, it is clear that if I take instead of the 
some linear combination after the plus getting. You know how matrix vector multiplication works. We can take scalars out, and the matrix times the sum of vectors. Matrix can be applied to the vectors in the group. This will be alpha A acting on me plus beta A acting on you. So matrix vector multiplication is linear, and therefore matrices are an example of linear operators acting on a vector space. Notice that the dimension of V and the dimension of W needn't actually be the same. If we take vectors that are three-dimensional and multiply them by a matrix which is three by two, then we will get out the vectors that are two-dimensional. And so various maps that actually lose information are also possible. Then another example of a linear operation is rotation. If we take a rotation matrix, I've given you a few examples in the past lectures, and likewise apply it to alpha V plus beta U, we know that if we multiply a vector by a number and then rotate it, or if we first rotate it and then multiply it by a number, the result should be changed. And then because collections of vectors are rotated synchronously, a sum of two vectors is also uh, a rotated vector 1 plus a rotated vector 2. So this will be alpha r v plus beta r v. And that's simply a special case of a matrix operation because rotation is a matrix of vectors. A more um, complicated example is differentiation. If we take, for example, second derivative d2 by d squared, Acting on alpha of x plus beta g of x. Again, from your basic differentiation rules, you know that you can take constants out of the differentiation, and a derivative of any order of a sum is likewise a sum of derivatives. Alpha d2 by dx squared of x plus beta g Second differentiation is a linear operation. So in integration, we take an indefinite integral, alpha of f of x plus beta g of x dx. Again, from basic rules of integration, we know that this is alpha integral of x dx plus beta integral. And the integration operator in this case is integral of the function dx. So the operator A is integral dx. That's acting on something that occurs in front of it. So the summary here, I think, is that most of the operations that you have been learning so far in this course are actually linear operations, and there's a very good reason for that, because this is mathematics, chemistry. All of these operators will then make an appearance in quantum mechanics. So these are linear maps, and as you will see in your second year, various elementary derivatives correspond to various subsurfaces. Momentum, angular momentum, and so on. So the second topic is how does wave function mechanics, which is all about functions, suddenly mutate into the quantum mechanics that has matrices and vectors in it. And this is called representation and this is singularly important in computational chemistry because if you look at what kind of problems present themselves in computational chemistry, they are invariably differential. And you have seen by now how difficult it is to solve differential equations. Even the most basic non-uniform first order OD is easily a page of mathematics. By the time it becomes a second order OD, which is very common, that's two pages of mathematics. And when it's got for me something realistic, like three-dimensional partial differential equations, uh, then, well, it's not quantum order. In 
practical chemistry these days because this will be pages upon pages upon pages of analytical transformations, which might in the end not have any slightest relevance because the shape of your ring or the shape of your reactor or some profile of some pressure will be numerically defined and therefore analytically unrepresented. So we need to find a connection between the analytical formalism we have developed and vector matrix notation, which computers crunch with extraordinary speed. If you look at how much, um, how many operations a modern graphics card does, the latest NVIDIA Titan V does 10 to the 13th multiplications per second, which is an outrageous number. It wasn't very long ago that a thousand multiplications per second was considered uh, in a military grade that was several tons and it occupied a lot of space. And now you have 10 to the 13th multiplications per second, which is a number that's more commonly associated with certain dynamics than it is with computing. Anyway, representations. So imagine we have a function, and as per the content of the previous lecture, what we did is we expanded it in some basis set. So it will be a sum over k from n plus 1 uh, to, in general, infinity, the spaces we're dealing with might be infinite dimensional, a and g n of x, where g n is an orthonormal basis. Remember that such expansions are unique which means that a given function has only one set of coefficients. And the specific set of coefficients corresponds to only one function. That is, this function uniquely determines these coefficients, but these coefficients, in turn, uniquely determine this function. Why don't we, instead of suffering through the analytical form of this expression, define a corresponding vector? which will be just a1, a2, a3, and so on. This we have to deal with manually. A vector we can subcontract to a computer, because this is what computers do extremely well. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we found a way of translating all the horrible analytical mathematics that we'd rather not do to nice and uh, at least procedurally straightforward numerical mathematics that we can outsource to a computer. And that is the subject of the representation scene. So let's begin with something that the second years will recognize, and the first years I will tell you what that is. Um, now the second years know that this is the time independent Schrodinger's equation, and this H is a huge bunch of derivatives and so on. And to the first years, this is just an eigenfunction problem. So there is some horrible operator containing lots of derivatives for which we would like to find such functions that it simply multiplies by a number. You remember how we did it with matrix vector case, right? It was some matrix and here's some vector, and it was multiplied by some number. Uh, turns out that exactly the same structure occurs in molecular particles. Okay, so this we'd rather not solve because this is a horrible function. Let us now do this trick. Let us say that we will find the basis, some concrete basis set in function space, I don't know, sine and cosine, something like that, or complex exponentials. We've demonstrated that they are somewhere on the previous lecture. And we will do the following. We will write our psi and say there surely must exist an expansion like this. Sum over k, a, a, g, k, o in some basis set that we can pick. Okay, if we take this and we substitute it into that equation, what's going to happen? Well, we will have the Hamiltonian acting on this sum, k, 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 g of x equals e sum k, 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 g, k of x. The important thing about Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics is that they are linear operators. Whatever they are, none of you actually have encountered a real Hamiltonian before, but it's just a collection of differentiation instructions in most cases. 
derivatives are linear, and so therefore are Hamiltonians. Therefore, we can take these a's out, and we can remove the sum and put it in front. The h will simply be acting on the individual case. And um, likewise, in this case. So what we will then have is a sum over k, a, k, Hamiltonians acting on gk of x equals a sum with the energy in front, a, k, g, k of x. So far so let us now do the following. Let us take both sides of this expression and calculate the scalar product with some specific function gm. We will pick one of these g's and we will take a scalar product with the m function. Where m is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. We will, as a result, have a system of equations numbered by m where the following will happen. It will be a sum over k, a, k, g, m, h, g, k, equals to e sum over k, a, k, g, m, g, k. A pretty horribly complicated so far, as you can see, but uh, there are possible simplifications here. Uh, notice that this is zero in most cases when m is not equal to k, and this is one when m is exactly equal to k, so in this huge sum over k, only one term will survive in which k happens to be exactly equal to m. So this simplifies. The second observation we will make is this, is we took a function, we applied a bunch of derivatives to it, and then we took a scalar product with another function. And scalar product is just an integral. And so that bracket over there is perhaps a horribly complicated integral, but still ultimately just a number. So g m h acting on g k, as per our definition, is an integral, and since we're dealing with quantum mechanics in one dimension, here probably for minus infinity to infinity, uh, g m conjugate x h acting on g k of x dx. If h is the first derivative, well, we have to differentiate that cosine multiplied by a sine takes it. No problem. If this g is some horrible exponential or whatever other function, really, we can pick up our arbitrary basis set. Uh, if that contains second third derivatives, whatever it may be, it's still ultimately just a number. And so we will call that number. Uh, we will give it a name, we will call it h, and it will only depend on index m and index k. So it will be h, m, k. Okay, we can now rewrite this in a much more compact notation. It's still a system over m, but then the sum is the sum over k, h, m, k times a, k equals actually just e a m because most of this is zero. You can see a pretty drastic simplification by now and then let us take a good look at what this is. We have h and k times a k. Remember what the matrix vector multiplication was. We have a times b and we want the case element of it, uh, or in that case, it will be nth element. This is the sum over k, a, and k, b, k. So nth element of the product is your vector multiplied into the corresponding row of the matrix and so on. So that thing there is actually a piece of the matrix vector product. 
And if we actually recognize that and realize that this M simply runs down the letter, this is A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and that is a matrix multiplying A, and that is actually H matrix acting on A vector equals B A vector. Something that all of you know extremely well how to solve. And so a horribly complicated problem that could have been partial differential equation in three and a half dimensions got morphed after a little bit of integration into a matrix vector eigensystem problem, which you are all perfectly comfortable with, and certainly a computer is perfectly comfortable with. And once we have solved this, we will obtain the A which is just a list of numbers, a1, a2, a3, a4. We put them back here. We know what these functions have been, and that is our solution. That's the wave function that satisfies this equation. So this entire process, whereby we have taken an analytical equation, and by introducing a basis, converts it into a numerical equation, is called a matrix representation or a differential equation. And these matrices are typically in the sense of thousands. If I'm looking at a molecule, so my student actually is currently computing the molecular orbitals uh, for a steroid, fluorinated steroid, it would have in this basis a couple of thousand functions. The integrals are actually quite easy to because these Hamiltonians are derivatives, and if you make these G's complex exponentials, they don't even change when you take derivatives. And then products of exponentials are very easy to integrate. So these things are cheap, and the machine can do it automatically. Um, it generates a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix H. Um, it runs the eigen system calculation. It produces all the energies, which in that case would be the energies of all the molecular orbitals, and the associated, associated expansion coefficients um, so, I think by now it should be clear to the second years what it was that you have been doing uh, in all those molecular particle classes. You have been given without much explanation. You have been dumped straight into the matrix representation of the problem and then told that mysteriously, you know, the eigenvalues correspond to the images. Well, this is why. Because this comes straight out of Erwin Schrodinger, or rather, um, a variable separation in his equation. We'll get to that in a couple of lectures. And then this is the mathematical connection to what you have. Okay, so this is matrix representation. And so now it is time to introduce the piece itself that is uh, the quantum mechanics uh, for which this is all necessary. And we will introduce it not like the chemists do, but we will introduce it in light of all the mathematics that we have derived. Now, as more and many things in science, quantum mechanics has largely been guessed and then found to be correct. To this day, there is no strict, rigorous, complete derivation of Schrodinger's equation. There is an element of guesswork in the middle. You can get pretty far from the philosophical principle of causality and the Lie algebra, but then at some point you have to make a leap of um, faith and realize that a certain operator there is actually the energy operator. Um, then Dirac, who made all of that relativistic, also more or less guessed uh, the forms of the corresponding matrices, and they then later turned out to be correct. And so we are here um, entering the territory where the only justification we have for doing things that way is that it works. And there is no um, global, rational, big reason for why it should be that way. Um, there is at the most based on elegance because it's the smallest equations um, that we realistically know about that all nonetheless happen to describe the whole reality. And so this is elegance um, observation is actually surprisingly powerful. It tends to be small things uh, that um, are correct. Okay, so postulates of quantum mechanics. First, there exists for any system a 
there exists a function called wave function, psi, that is a function of all coordinates of all constituent particles and time. Psi of R1, R2, R3, and time, where R1 is the coordinate of the first electron, R2 of the second electron, R3 of some quark inside the nucleus, and so on. All elementary particles in there will be entering into that function as parameters. Now, this function contains complete information about the system. It's every conceivable property, and as well as its future and its past. So containing all that is no longer about the system. Now, that's a pretty outrageous assumption to make. It is not clear why such a function would ever exist, why it should be a function uh, of you know, particular things. And uh, if it does exist, it's not entirely clear what to do with it. And so, of course, there's a great big scandal about quantum mechanics. Such a function does, in fact, exist, uh, which is wonderful because, well, it pays my salary, more or less. And then, once we have this function, the entirety of this machinery kicks in. On the corresponding space of functions, we can define the metric. Right? So, we can define the norm, sine of x, exactly like we defined it in the previous lecture, integral sine of x conjugate sine of x dx square root and x in here I mean it in the general sense that is this will be a multiple integral over all coordinates of all particles in the system. If we have 25 particles each has an x, y, z so this will be a 75 fold integral. Right? Welcome to real life. Maybe the biggest one you've taken so far was just one particle in three dimensions. Um, okay, and then of course the scale of product, if we have two wave functions, sine and phi, then that would be an integral sine conjugate of x phi of x dx. So the metric that we have introduced in the previous lecture is there in quantum mechanics. The second postulate for every observable, observable meaning things like energy, momentum, angular momentum, properties that pertain to an individual molecule rather than ensemble. Temperature and pressure are ensemble properties, so it doesn't apply to ensemble properties. It applies to, for example, the location of the electron, if it's a single electron. So for every observable that an individual quantum system can have, there exists a corresponding linear operator. There is a linear operator O such that the value of the observable, and I will explain these brackets in a moment, is psi O psi, and you have already seen an integral like this here. So that's essentially integral psi function of x times the operator, usually a bunch of derivatives. Yes. And this O in here in brackets refers to the average outcome of repeated measurements. Average outcome of repeated experiments. 
on that particular quantum system. Now, that's an interesting statement to make again, and this has philosophical implications. There, are, there is a fundamental indeterminacy for quantum systems um, that are in a so-called mixed state, where repeated measurements might yield a different answer every time you perform them. <coughs> However, the arithmetical average of infinitely many measurements would match this value that we have computed like that. So even though the wave function determines everything about the system, on occasion it would only predict an average quantity that we would measure. And the operators are um, quite simple usually, so the operator corresponding to the coordinate is just multiplication by x. So operator acting on a function just multiplies it by that function. An operator for momentum uh, in the direction x is minus i by dx. The operator for kinetic energy is 1 over 2m d2 by dx squared, and simple things like that. In fact, out of coordinate and momentum, you can reconstruct pretty much everything else there is in quantum mechanics. And so, the combinations of these are just complicated chains of derivatives and multiplications. So even though the eventual equations that quantum mechanics has um, are pretty horrifying, the operators, the elementary operators that enter them are actually quite simple. OK, so that's the second postulate. And um, again, it does have a justification. That is, if you really try, after learning a lot of mathematics called Lie algebras, it is possible to establish this fact from fairly basic philosophical assumptions, but here in a chemistry course, to us, this is a given. It's, it is a postulate, and in fact, originally, as quantum mechanics was developed, this was introduced as more or less a postulate, or a fortuitous guess, whichever way you like to look. So, postulate number three wave functions. Day, Schrodinger's equation. At least in the non relativistic case where the various velocities are, are away from the speed of light, and that is d by dt sine of x times t is minus i Hamiltonian operator. Notice that this equation is not what chemists have been telling you is Schrodinger's equation. We will make a connection between this and this in two lectures from now when we deal with partial differential equations. But this is the equation that wave functions obey. Uh, and the other two uh, postulates refer to the interpretation of quantum mechanics. And um, there's a little problem in there because as human beings, we were, you know, hunter-gatherers most of our evolutionary history, and we know to how to kill um, a mouse, right, and drag it into the cave by the trunk, and it, it's not a quantum object. And so we have not evolved to perceive and through our evolutionary history, we haven't evolved to perceive quantum mechanical things directly. And therefore, to us, the best avenue of trying to reason about it is through their associated mathematical properties, which we can at least comprehend somehow. But it would appear that almost any way of interpreting quantum mechanics is very, very arguable. And um, philosophers have been muddying water a rather a lot on the subject, and physicists have been pointing and laughing at them, and it, it on goes. So the interpretation, one of the more, uh, the less controversial interpretations is called the Copenhagen interpretation, uh, where in the absolute square of the wave function is associated with the probability density. Roughly speaking, the likelihood of finding a particle in a particular volume in space, a particular infinitesimal volume. 
And um, the A function itself has uh, it's a complex value function without any obvious interpretation, but as soon as the as soon as absolute square is identified with probability, that's actually something we can realistically relate to. Right? Take the absolute square, plot it in three dimensions, and that's the probability of finding the election if you fall in the point. So that's actually quite um, a reasonable thing. However, what this does lead to is, of course, the constraints that are then imposed on probabilities within the probability theory. In particular, the sum of all probabilities must be 1, because if you're looking here, it might be there with some probability, but it has to be somewhere with the probability of 1. And therefore, within probability theory, it's a requirement that the integral dx of t dx is 1. Which then, of course, translates to the associated requirement for the wave function. Psi absolute square dx must be 1. But you have already seen such an object um, is the norm. So, psi absolute square dx is actually the norm of psi square. And so the requirement for the wave function is therefore to have unit norm, which is why I taught you the norms in the lecture in this morning and showed you how to normalize functions and then how to normalize vectors. So this interpretation of the wave function as probability density necessarily leads to the fact that the wave function must be normalized. in the sense that it should have the unit norm. And norm is the integral followed by the square root. Okay, and then the final um, postulate is, again, it's bringing us back to the eigensystems. If we have such a function, so if system, if the system is in a state psi such that psi is an eigenfunction of the corresponding operator, so some observable acting on psi returns us the same psi. So if psi is an eigenfunction of, for example, momentum, then a measurement of that property will yield exactly lambda every time. So the measure O will produce lambda every time. However, if psi <coughs> is not an eigen function, for example, psi is pi 1 plus pi 2 divided by root 2, where these two are eigenfunctions of O, then you will have, in general, different values of lambda. And if we write a general linear combination here, so when our psi is A, a1 by 1 plus a2 by 2, and so on, where phi and k are eigenfunctions of O, then we will get, when we measure O, lambda 1 with probability. Lambda 2 with probability A2 absolute squared, and so on. So a rather strange um, postulate takes some thinking to get comfortable with it. The consequence of this, however, is that in any linear combination, we must have A absolute squared 1 plus A absolute squared 2, and so on. Because these squares are probabilities, 
the sum must be 1. And so any vector representations of the equations, when we write these a's out as a vector, must likewise be normalized vectors. Otherwise, the balance of probabilities in the system is not going to be physically correct. So let me just go through that um, perhaps again, because that's a lot to take in with not an awful lot of explanation as to why. Now, partially this is because such explanations do not exist. And any of them that do exist require the level of algebraic background that you chemists do not yet have. For those of you who will go on to do computational chemistry PhDs, by about the end of your PhD, we'll be able to explain why most of this is the case, uh, but not at the moment, so take my word for uh, these things, uh, and I've sort of swept under the rug uh, quite a lot of complications uh, that happen there. Okay, so the philosophical observation that the Schrodinger made, uh, grossly implausible, but the one that turned out to be correct, is that wave functions do in fact exist. Any uh, microscopic quantum system, there exists a function containing concrete information about everything that can, in principle, be known about that system. We have created the mathematical infrastructure for handling functions and function spaces and function expansions precisely uh, to equip you with the tools to work with these models. Then quantum mechanics appears uh, to have linear operators associated with each observable. Every time you're measuring something, that corresponds to a linear differential operator or integral differential operator, the things that obey this. And then the average outcome of an experiment, for example, if we are measuring the coordinate, we are given the wave function, you put the wave function here, you put the x multiplication there, you put the wave function here. Wave function times wave function is the probability, so this actually corresponds to a statistical expression for the average coordinate here, x times the probability. So it all links to the probability theory quite well. This is how the average interval will be calculated. Now, if you happen to be sitting in an eigenfunction of O, then, of course, it would not actually influence the XPSI, and you will get the same answer every time you are performing the measurement. However, if you are sitting in a state that is not an eigenfunction, but a linear combination of eigenfunctions, then experimentally, when you measure the quantity, you will be getting either the values that correspond to that wave function or the values that correspond to this at random. And at the moment, it is not known how to force a specific value in a system that is in a linear combination of wave functions. So it's fundamentally indeterminacy law. However, if you perform infinitely many measurements, then the average is always going to be this one. Then Schrodinger's equation, uh, about three pages of derivations uh, based on philosophy, but H is the operator that corresponds to energy. So you would have kinetic energy and then the potential energy. For example, the cooling interaction that goes into H. And then this partial differential equation we will be learning to solve in um, the lectures that we will have next week. The physical interpretation, the best we know, there are more exotic ones um, to do with you know, the universe splitting into multiple universes every time something happens. Um, you know, this is the less ridiculous of the lot is that the absolute square of the wave function has the physical meaning of the probability density, which kind of overlaps with that outcome in there. And as soon as we demand that it be the probability density, we require that the sum total, or in a continuous case, the integral, be equal to 1, in which case we instantly get that norm, which I have carefully introduced to you in the previous lecture without really telling you why. And so, to observe the balance of probabilities, um, the wave function must therefore be normalized. And then, if we have something that is in a linear combination of eigenfunctions of some operator, then the probability, so as per the last um, postulate, will be the modulus square of the corresponding coefficient. So, if this is particle flying left and that is particle flying right, and we are measuring 
where the particle is flying, that with the probability a1 modulus square it will be flying left, and the probability of a2 modulus square it will be flying right in the actual experimental outcome. And of course, if the squares of these are probabilities, then we must likewise have some of those probabilities equal to 1. So when we are representing our problem with a function, the function must have a norm equal to 1. When we are representing our problem with a vector, the vector must have a norm equal to 1. And in Dirac's notation, the brackets are actually exactly the same. And here, I've given you the translation procedure that connects the equation we have for wave functions, that's a differential equation, by two derivatives. After we do the expansion in some specified basis set, a certain amount of, um, not terribly complicated, it just looks horrible, uh, but a certain amount of straightforward mathematics reduces a matrix vector equation that we know how to solve. And so this is how quantum mechanical calculations are done in practice. We start with a physical system. We know what the energy of that physical system depends on. These are all the Coulomb interactions and so on. So we can get that Hamilton. As soon as we've got the Hamiltonian, we can put it here and we can ask, okay, which functions are the particle functions? Well, let's pick some basis. We pick some basis. We know how these derivatives act on some basis functions like exponentials. So we can take this uh, causal bunch of integrals or ask a computer to do it for us. That gives us the matrix elements for this matrix H. At that point, this becomes a matrix vector problem. We solve it. We know how to do it. We get the corresponding vector. We put its element in here. That's our wave function. As soon as we know the wave function, we know every conceivable property of it. Any questions? Okay. And we will be learning how to solve that list in the next couple of days.